Well, if you're intrigued to find out, this is the panel discussion you've been waiting for. Join me in welcoming our international experts on the topic to get an understanding of the future of online gaming. I would like to thank our associate partner, Loco, home of Indian Gaming, uh, who has uh, partnered on this. And please uh, join me in welcoming Anirudh Pandita, the founder of Loco. We've got Michael, who's the International Sector Director, Esports and Gaming, you go uh, from Germany. We've got uh, Jacob uh, Schrader, the GM of uh, Esports at Zen Sports USA. We've got Marcus Howard, the author of Innovate Gaming and Esports, and also a member of Blockchain Game Alliance. And we've, of course, got Neera Shruparel, the head of mobile and emerging tech Group M, who has uh, gladly accepted to be the session chair for this discussion. Well, it's going to be a great one, and we're really for looking forward. Uh, Neeraj, uh, a great discussion, I'm sure, and uh, the mighty task of moderating it is in your hands. So, Neeraj, please take forth the library. Thank so you. Thank you so much, Bhavna. Pleasure. Question to the guests, should I log in with MR or VR? <laughs> <laughs> While the session was on, I just put it on. I was in my gaming zone. <laughs> Great start, Neeraj. Over to you. All right, guys. This is pretty much a subject which we all are super passionate about. So it doesn't even need a heads up per se. I, I would say let's just spend about one minute on what's keeping us busy these days on the topics which Bhavna just announced. Something that's keeping me super busy is this entire wave of metaverse. And I've been busy creating a lot of uh, sci-fi experiences here and in the Indian market, getting my brands on board as well. So the India's first wedding, you guys must have heard about it. That was completely conceptualized by us. And we got some of our brands like Coca-Cola to be part of it. ITC and a bunch of other brands to be part of it. One of, the, one of the, my personal favorites on Metaverse is the work which we did on Mondelez for Cadbury Silk, wherein we created a moon dating experience. One of the lucky couples from Mumbai. This is a lot of, lot of sci-fi work, which also happens on the gaming space, right from Roblox to Fortnite, to Sony PlayStation as well. So we are actually getting a lot of our brands immersed in those experiences, creating a lot of interesting brand integrations out there. So my question to begin with would be for Marcus. I've been a big fan of uh, your books and I've been reading it in a big way. And I was when uh, Imran came up to me, I was just reading up more about you and then I see your post on LinkedIn. My, my first question to Marcus would be, how will the metaverse grow the esports uh, space? Great question, Naraj, and thank you all for joining. I, I believe that the metaverse is going to give uh, esports teams the ability to have kind of scalable revenue and engagement opportunities. And shout out to Lowell Stevens. He's wrote a fantastic paper about that. So if you haven't seen it, definitely go check that out. But the ability to basically create these digital assets, these digital experiences that don't have the traditional kind of fixed price cost of in-person events, right? That it also has the ability to kind of activate a wider variety of brands because as, as we all know, the metaverse is really just the gaming industry. So if you start to get more brands into the gaming industry, now they have the opportunity to recognize the value to, to have this digital presence. And then that allows us to grow the total audience of brands that are engaging. What's your take on mixed reality? Because one of my favorite players in India, which is going to rewrite the history of mixed reality in India is Geo Tesseract. They're going to be bundling up the mixed reality hardware with geo fiber. It's going to enter our households in less than six months. It's going to be pretty much mainstream is what I feel. How, how would that pretty much uh, uh, drive the eSport wave? For well, eSports what... to go mainstream, I would say for eSports to go mainstream, how would, what role would mixed reality play? I think one of the, the challenges we have with, with scale is that there's still a stigma against video games. And then by extension, esports, people don't believe that you can be a, a sports athlete if you're sitting in your chair, you know, playing at, at a console or computer or mobile. And so what, what XR creates is the ability to have this kind of full body motion, full interaction that you, you associate with traditional sports. And then in that way, not only are you, you having more activity, so it's seen as more accepted, but then you also extend the amount of, of engagement opportunities, right? Extended reality means not only can you have esports from your home, but you can have it at, let's call it a Chuck E. Cheese or a stadium, or you know, there's simulation software where there's there's kind of extended reality uh, bicycle riding, and and I don't know if you've heard of Hado, which is basically digital dodgeball. Um, I just shared a, a I had an interview last week or earlier this week 
the gentleman who's getting ready to do with use extended reality to do the same thing to motorsports that laser tag has done to paintball. So you're driving an electric go-kart, but it feels like you're playing Mario Kart because you can shoot lasers and there are bombs and all kinds of power-ups. So it, it really helps kind of extend traditional sports. I think kind of creating this, this hybrid area between traditional and virtual, where again, there's just this massive opportunity to go mainstream. All right, Jacob, this one is for you. How to get rid of barriers of entry to blockchain games? That, that, that's, a, that's a question which keeps dropping in when we have conversations with a lot of our clients. What's your awesome. take on that? Of course, yeah. Uh, you know, also, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I would say the blockchain in general, right, is you know, huge for gaming. It basically provides players the ability to tangibly own their assets in games. And because the blockchain is extendable and, and never sleeps, right, those games are, or those, those assets are much more liquid than assets in video games have ever been before, right? Because these blockchain games are pretty new and there's only select few of them that have really taken off, you see prices, you know, that are extremely high in games like Splinterlands and Axie Infinity to just get into the game. Right. So that was, you know, I would say a year and a half ago, that was a really big deal and really hard for people to kind of get into blockchain gaming. Right. And, and the ability to lower the barrier entry is just what's going to make it go mainstream. Right. Or, or give it that push that it needs. So, you know, what we've seen over the last year is card renting, uh, asset renting and kind of in, in Axie Infinity specifically with their guilds, um, just the ability for, you know, users who have the assets to basically lend them to other users, right? That's huge and that's what's gonna help push blockchain gaming into the masses. Some games are doing it better than others, right? Splinterlands, it's actually on the blockchain. They have uh, coded into the smart contracts, basically or decentralized lending, right? And Axie, they do it with scholarships, which is slightly centralized. I know they're working at a solution to make it um, more decentralized, but just in general, it's that wave and that kind of, you know, that lending and, and the ability to rent that's that's really going to lower the barrier of entry. All right, questions to Anirudh now. Anirudh, we've been doing a lot of work on uh, Web3 and gaming. Why is there so much excitement around this? Look, I think uh, as the other... My audio wear working fine. Said, uh, my two... voice is going through my audio wear. It's working well. It's working well. I could hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. I can. Um, I can. Go on. Okay. Oh, super. Um, yeah. I mean, the the big exciting thing is that love that cap. Uh, you know, with local in there, right there. Thank you. Yes. So so you know, for us, there are two things, right? Gaming is going to become more immersive with uh, with five G coming in. Mobile uh, computing is going to get better. And so you're going to finally see people are going to immerse themselves in these worlds. It's already happened with desktop. You, you know, you were on Oculus. The Oculus price point is not too different from a mobile phone. Um, so you're going to see people going towards more immersive entertainment, more immersive um, experiences. And gaming is obviously the easiest and most fun way to get in there, right? If you played, you know, you were talking about I spend an inordinate amount of time uh, playing cricket uh, on the Oculus. A really fun game. It's not like super advanced in terms of its graphics, but the basic gameplay is great. So you end up feeling like you're actually in a stadium. And, you know, I spend other times on an app like Wander, where I'm just wandering around different parts of the world. And in the lockdown, that's an unbelievable feeling, but also for someone who may not have the money yet to go do that. When you combine that sort of immersive experience with what uh, Web3 is going to do, which is it's allowing you to actually own a piece of, um, you know, the web in some sense, um, the fact that you can own your own skins, you can own a uh, certain digital merchandise that allows for a very, very different level of, um, of engagement and of fandom, right? I own this cap. I own a Liverpool cap. I'm a big Liverpool fan, whether local lives or dies, the Liverpool lives or dies, I own this cap, right? But tomorrow, if, you know, if, if some of these other games, which are popular today, you bought, let's say you spent $10,000, you know, you love the game. If it dies, you get nothing you will be left with zero. And that doesn't happen in, in, in these online worlds now. So I think the fact that you can combine immersion with ownership means it's the next level of uh, fandom. And um, I think as Marcus was suggesting earlier, there's no reason that through smart contracts, you cannot even, uh, you can't actually control the clubs or make certain key decisions with those clubs, right? So 
you know, just the same way a shareholders agreement uh, today enables uh, shareholders to govern uh, an enterprise, the same way a DAO is being governed by smart contracts or certain things. Right? Everything is not 100% decentralized yet, but we are going to a place where you could say that, hey, if you're going to bid on a player who's, you know, where you're going to spend $100 million, you have to get everybody to say yes, because that's that's a major decision, right? Or if you want to change the stadium, if you want to sell the stadium rights, like if I as a fan don't ever want my stadium to have a uh, lose name, right? So that you can't do today, right? And I think a lot what people don't appreciate enough is the best sporting clubs in the world have a lot of history to them. And that history comes through fans and a, a loyalty that's been built over time. And I think both these things are happening together. And I think that makes it an, an amazing and exciting time to work in the industry. Like you said, every time I get onto my Oculus and uh, an Oculus is pretty much much cheaper than uh, a mobile device, like you mentioned, right? And every time I get into it and I'm playing a game, I start thinking, how do I integrate my brand's problem statement back onto this real estate? So I was just playing an AR puzzle game, which was about fixing Taj Mahal altogether. And I was thinking, why can't I get Fevicol in, you know? Like put up Fevicol and get this all together. We used to do a lot of interesting stuff with uh, Angry Birds Robio. So if you run out of birds, uh, you go and watch a AV out there, and you get a pop-up bird and you can just go along and play the game, right? So what's your, what's your take on uh, uh, advertisers in this new age world of online gaming predominantly? How, how will it go mainstream? Um, is this a question to me? I can, I can yeah, question. yeah, yeah, I'm continuing with you. Yeah, so for, I mean, look, you know, having built uh, a large content company like Pocket Aces, which is a leader in its field today, you know, we built it when digital video was not so big in India in 2015, right? And gaming, I was saying from 2018 is a mainstream entertainment format. And it's only in 2021 that we've seen it grow in that fashion. I think advertisers are always going to be reactive. The best advertisers will obviously take uh, a leap forward early. Um, but attention is going to move. And when attention moves, advertisers will certainly move. And I think advertising is when the consumer is happy consuming that advertising without thinking it's you know something disruptive right so that's one form of advertising when you come to immersive certain things that the brands will advertisers will obviously get into because it's it's where the future is it's where attention will move same thing with gaming and there are interesting formats right you know currently you think that they're only banner ads but you could have audio ads which while you're playing a game it's not as disruptive right uh, we we're still progressing along how uh, what different advertising formats can mean. Uh, even as the previous sponsor BMW was saying, I mean, I, we, we've just done an esports tournament where you know they, their uh, integration with one of the phone brands was playing and people didn't drop off because they saw it as a uh, validation of their community, right? But I think there's lots of interesting ways in which advertisers will come into uh, the mix. And even um, you know the, the newest form of advertisers will find a way of engaging those communities in a very meaningful manner. So uh, you know whether it's in a play to earn uh, sort of uh, situation or even on a local where you know let's say if uh, you know you're trying to support I as, an, uh, as a user I'm trying to support a certain athlete, you know you can support it through virtual goods which I can send to them or you you know you know a Pepsi can say I'm going to support it and every fan of this particular person every single virtual good is free from my side. Right now suddenly like. Pepsi is putting itself as a, um, you know, as a fan with, uh, with the common, uh, you know, user. So I think there are a lot of interesting ways for, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, more niche brands for mainstream brands. And I think what we're seeing in gaming in India is that it's breaking uh, geographical and, uh, you know, eco grounds. With a phone, you can start showing your. Um, uh, showing your skill and actually to to uh, to Marx's point on esports earlier as well, what can happen is that your you know if you were for example buying card collectibles or you're playing these games which are the modern fantasy uh, games with NFTs in them, today if you have no chance of being a scout in a in a year or two if you show people that you know esports owners that look look at my portfolio of picks that I made, you know you it's completely uh, something that can be uh, you know. Uh, verified by them, right? So because the provenance is there. So suddenly you have a completely new job and a completely new way of getting that job. Very similar to how, say, you know, digital video where you could now just make, you know, point and shoot, make a video. And suddenly the new digital stars came up that way. As you think about the future of esports, of sport itself, this is a simple way in which people can start participating. And that means, again, regardless of where you are, 
your skill will put you forward. So I think it's it's an exciting time and that advertisers can actually come into that uh, fold as well and, and really, really, um, you know, build interesting clubs, you know, football clubs, you know, have historically been... perspective, I would say, Andrew, that totally sold on it. I said, if I may, I would, Niraj, if I may, I would, would really like, like, like to build on um, what was said earlier, because um, why our data actually shows that if you find a way to non-intrusively bring yourself into your game, this is the perfect way to sell something, because it's not perceived as advertisement, it's perceived as part of the game. There was an example um, over here, well, finally in my home market in Germany, where a frozen food brand, which has nothing to do with, uh, with GTA, brought themselves into the game, branded all the stores over the more or less Christmas period with their branding and put their, um, their, their, their stuff in the stores for sale. I looked into the data because I found this super intriguing and uh, the consideration rate. So not only yeah, awareness and so on, but really would people buy their products jumped up five times as high as before. And this is showing what a decent audience you can reach and what the effects could be if you find a way which is super easy to do as you saw here then um, with a clever ad but advertisement campaign which is not even perceived as advertisement but being part of the, part of the game that, that's 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 brilliant so we started with uh, marcus with a perspective on uh, metaverse gaming and how mixed reality is going to have a play out there we moved to jacobs and we covered this entire space of blockchain gaming and Anirudha gave us an absolutely amazing perspective on the online game side of it and advertisers play out there. My question to Michael would be more on the lines of cryptocurrencies. So how do you see esports fans see the world of cryptocurrencies? <laughs> yeah, this is a question that uh, is just discussed heavily. I mean, building on, on Marcus' points, there are still so many misconceptions around those target groups and so on. Um, Thank God we are amongst pros here, so do I don't they, have to do go they, into the... uh, Michael, do they really embrace it? Do they really understand the general population? Yeah, yeah, this is what I was, what I was going to, to aim at. Um, yes, they do. And uh, much, much more than the general population. Um, they're not even understand it better. They use it more often. And they, they also see this as a new way of investment. I mean, to be fair, we have a target group here that is tax heavy, has a higher share of people that are um, at universities studying IT and so on. So there is an affinity between, between the, those two, but this is not, not all to explain it. So we again, we have a super young and avid target group here that is a bit more towards newer technologies, being, being more on the forefront of things, trying things out. Being a gamer at heart doesn't hurt here. So, um, in general, the general population is still leaning back on cryptocurrency. I mean, Joe Biden just yesterday issued um, that, that the US government has to look into, into cryptocurrency and find a way how to really deal with it. Um, so this is more or less the, the standpoint of the general population with esports fans being much, much more advanced in, in, uh, in, in this area. What's your take on a lot of these uh gaming platforms are now becoming, in bits and pieces, I would say, are becoming brand unsafe. Copa compliance is something which is keeping a lot of brands away from these platforms. Chinlin Online Protection Act. So a lot of, lot of these platforms have got a lot of uh, uh, messy content which is appearing. So, so how is the ecosystem countering that space now? Anyone, anyone can, can maybe take this question. Yeah, I'm happy to take it from a given the near streaming platform and we see some of these things. I think as a, a platform, you have to put, regardless whether there's an act on, there's no act, you have to put safety uh, as a paramount, um, you know, um, KPI for yourself and your platform. So what we've done is uh, we have no tolerance for any sort of, you know, lewd content. We, we have an active team that moderates that content. We also have uh, kind of cutting edge features built uh, using ML, which quickly find out whether some, you know, whether there's bad language, et cetera, that's being used. And that's always a cop and robber type situation. You you do something, they they figure out how to go with it, but you put your best foot forward, uh, do that. Yeah, and and do on all the, certainly on all the, sorry, hey, can you, can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I was saying basically for the uh, some of the larger streams, we always have manual moderators. And for all the individual guys, they have to be moderated and going forward, uh, which we've given streamers their own moderator tools. And going forward, we will be making that a pretty key requirement for you to end up having a monetization channel, et cetera. So we are making it a key priority. And, and I think other platforms uh, which are serious are doing the same. Sure, sure. Jacob, another, just a follow-up to the question which I asked you, what's going to bring the blockchain gaming to the mainstream? Of course. Uh, yeah, so, you know, right now, blockchain gaming, it, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's only a few games that really are, are popular to, uh, you know, a, a really great extent. Now, I would say bringing blockchain gaming to consoles and, and being able to connect a a wallet to, to the Xbox or to the PS4 is really going to be a huge step for, you know, the, the mainstream popularity of blockchain gaming, right? They can kind of do what they do with, with mobile blockchain games where you're not able to make purchases uh, because doing so with the 30% the fee that the distributors take would be really difficult. But, you know, we, we've seen some blockchain games go mobile, right? Skyweaver just did it. The game looks awesome. Uh, it's great. But, you know, to get console is really the next level of, of mainstream gamers. So I think once that's kind of able to be done, uh, blockchain gaming can really explode. How about cryptocurrencies? The gamers, do they have a different view on cryptocurrencies? The point which uh, Michael mentioned? I, I would say certainly. Uh, I, I would say gamers yeah. are, you know, more, it, you know, it was, there was a scene from Ready Player One right, where the main character runs out of gas and all of a sudden he sells something on his body and basically coins poof up and he's able to load those into his car and that's gas, right? And that just, you know, kind of, as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh my gosh, that's cryptocurrency, right? That's the ability for the assets in a game to be unbelievably liquid to the fact that you can sell something, you know, move it to another chain potentially and, and take in uh, another asset kind of instantaneously. And that's what gamers need, right? There's so many small transactions in gaming, so much microtransactions that it's, you know, kind of perfect for cryptocurrency. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can see and Marcus has something to add to this point. You're having a laugh about it at that point. Marcus, you want to well, add to Go this? ahead, Mike, Michael, go ahead. Thanks, Marcus. So totally building on what, on, on what, what Jacob just said, well, our data totally underlines this because to be fair, comparing esports fans to the general population might not be the best comparison to draw here, but esports fans as a subsample of the gamers is more the correct way, way, way to go. And yeah, gamers, they, as you said, Jacob, well, exclamation mark, yes, they have a deeper understanding. They have, they, they already use it. And still in, in this group, which is a huge group, the game, the, the esports fans still are way uh, way forward. So they even use cryptocurrency more than, than, than gamers per se, but still the application of cryptocurrency and so on. To be fair, I'm the only one in, in the people that I know that, that has some cryptocurrency and they all look at me, oh, well, yeah, yeah. This, this Bitcoin stuff, you do that? Yes, I do that. <laughs> well, what's about it? It's not like I'm going to a brothel or anything. It's cryptocurrency. So man, dude, um, yeah. How do we get this in, into the general population like this? talking about it this is nothing strange it is just man come on this is just the normal way to do things so marcus now you're on marcus you want to add to it yeah i i, I agree with everything that jacob and michael said and i think we all understand that you don't have to teach gamers about digital items and digital currencies right like i started playing video games when i was six with super mario brothers three that you can't see on the camera because of the background let me try this <laughs> here we go there and now you can see it right and so you, you collect coins which are digital currencies and when you collect 100 coins you get an extra life which is a digital item you know there are mushrooms and and, and the, the raccoon tail all of that so it, it's it's part and parcel of the experience for gaming um and and as everyone here has mentioned like what you can't do right now is like basically you invest into this ecosystem you basically don't get anything back beyond entertainment and nothing against the the value of entertainment obviously we all love the value of entertainment but blockchain gaming is going to kind of take it to the next level where you you literally have you know this nirvana opportunity to play to earn you know i don't i don't have to be i don't have to have a yacht right from playing video games but if i could pay my rent and get my groceries by playing video games like i'd be a happy person i would do that right now <laughs> marcus just to follow up to this 
a quick one on your book here. Yeah? We are we are big fan of your book out there. How help the gaming community? Your book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, and and I actually have uh, a team from India and I don't know if you can let me do this again. Oh, I can't see it. I wish I could turn the background. Oh, there goes part of it. So I can see that. Uh, you can see that. So what what you can't see because of the background is is basically I, this is a team from India. So I, I have oh. six con six continents represented in the book. Um, you know, and and actually it's been distributed now to six continents. Just as as uh, from the the previous panel we discussed here, like education is the key to get this mainstream adoption. So I built this book to educate gamers who are kids and, and gamers of all ages, but also parents, teachers, ecosystem leaders, you know, mayors and, and influencers about gaming and esports, the $180 billion gaming industry, the billion dollar esports industry. And in this, I actually have a dedicated chapter, one for the metaverse and a separate dedicated chapter for NFTs, blockchain and crypto. So as people are reading this book and playing the demos that are included in the book, they learn about this space. And, and actually, I also have an NFT that allows you to, to view the entire book virtually and has a bunch of extra bonus content that's bound to the NFT. So it's not just a JPEG and I don't want to go on that, that soapbox, but it, it, there's extra functionality to it so that people, as they're getting the book, they're learning about cryptos and blockchain and the metaverse in the process. Super. Just as uh, closing comments, I would like to hear from you guys, maybe one minute each on future of online gaming. How do you guys see it all evolving over a period of time? Sagar Anirudh? Yeah, all I'll say is, uh, especially in the Indian context, we're going to uh, use this word gamers in five years because everybody's going to be a gamer, right? Like we don't say, are you a television viewer or like do you watch series? Like everybody's watching it's the number so large. And I think, um, you know, as, uh, you know, the, uh, um, you know, other panelists have said, I think blockchain is really going to create a new wealth redistribution. Um, you're going to see a lot of, a lot more people able to participate, get new jobs. And um, I think one of the reasons that we haven't seen uh, blockchain really, uh, all the crypto really go into the gaming community much in India is because it's really hard right now. So that's something that, you know, companies like us are going to tackle get people to get uh, crypto, even if it's a small number that so that they don't actually see the difference. And once your uh, experience, your experience becomes easy enough. Uh, and uh, it's a really exciting place. And as a gamer, I couldn't be happier. I get paid to do this. So you know, it's a tap dance to work when, <laughs> when you have a job like, so I'm, I'm super and excited. I think our network, network is poor, but we heard you. Jacob, you want to go next? Absolutely. So to me, the, the future of online gaming is more interactivity, right? It's more peer to peer features within games that allow people to connect. Uh, it's, it's kind of going away from single player games where it's a storyline and you're not able to play with, with others or live in a virtual world where you can interact kind of like the sandbox or other metaverse platforms. I think we're really moving in a place where it's all about interactivity. It's all about uh, kind of being able to play games with your friends, right? If you can't play it with your friend, if you can't kind of show off a layer of personal expression through a game, uh, it, it's not gonna be popular. And I think that's where online gaming is going. Super. Marcus, you want to go next? Sure. And, and I want to give a shout out to the, the team in India, Boolean Network. Uh, they, they're actually getting ready to launch their platform. So glad to make introductions for anyone who's interested. Um, what they're doing, what I, I believe is the future of gaming is, is decentralizing access for opportunity because they're allowing basically independent creators to, to have 360 degrees of, of monetization. But I, I think in the future, what you'll see is gaming redefining not just the gameplay experience, but you know, the way we do education, workforce development, business engagement, not just like business to consumer, but business to business. Because again, 60, uh, you know, 66% of Americans and, and nearly half of the world's population plays video games. We'll see video games redefine like how we experience our personal and business lives the same way that we have seen social media do that over the last 20 years. Michael, you want to round up the conversations for us? I have exactly 30 seconds. Sure. Thank you. 
there's almost everything has been said. So I think that mobile mobile devices should not be underestimated. Having these things here always with us makes the access of gaming easier and um, gives us leisure time whenever we need it. And cryptocurrencies are here to stay and grow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, mark. thank you so much. Thank you so to much for this interesting panel conversation. <laughs> thank you, E4M, for evangelizing the space of gaming. There are interesting times ahead, and our panelists today shared some of the really in insightful data points on gaming and future of online gaming. So stay tuned onto this event. Have a good conference, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neeraj. Uh, well, I have to say cheers to everyone who's taken out their valuable time, everyone across the various parts uh, across the world. I know there are different time zones and I don't want to get to that, but I, I'd really like to appreciate all your effort for joining in and your valuable intakes. Thank you.